Hey folks, uh, happy day after Thanksgiving. This is the Battle Axe Broadcasting Network bringing you our favorite things <laughs> on Black Friday uh, for the dog or the dog lover in your life. This is a curated list of things that we personally use and endorse for not only our own dogs, but for our client dogs as well. Uh, many of the items on this list I have been using for over 40 years. Some of the items on this list um, I've had for at least 25 or 30 of those years. So they're basically really, really good products. It's a spend one money and have for a lifetime as opposed to buy a bunch of stuff that you have to replace over and over and over again. Um, we're going to uh, avoid doing things like dog food and treats and things like that, or even leashes and collars, because this is a generic list based on um, all stages and ages, all sizes and breeds. This is not specific to training. These are just simply things that we use on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, I'm going to ask for your forgiveness in advance. Uh, the software is new to me, so switching between screens is a little bit of a problem. So uh, <laughs> hopefully this will go smooth for me so this morning. All right, here we go. First up on the list... an item that we use a great deal and every dog should be accustomed to the pets mate, uh, pet mate ultra very kennel now when you look at the screen you'll see that it's a variety of different sizes uh, back in the day these used to be called by um, hundreds 100 200 300 400 500 700 uh, we prefer the very kennels over wire one, because you, uh, they actually can be used for a variety of things besides a crate. We can actually use them as training tables. We can do a bunch of things with them. They're easy to clean and maintain. Uh, they're if they get broken or lost. Um, and on top of that, they are airline approved. Now, in the older versions of the Very Kennel, they only had the uh, windows on the door they did not have the back if you look closely you can actually see the cutouts in the back airlines require that all crates have ventilation on all four sides so they started doing this it kind of it doesn't really cheapen the integrity itself but um it can become difficult to clean if you're talking about sterilization these things can be removed this whole thing can be broken down it's a lot easier to clean than it is a wire also we don't like wire crates for a variety of reasons. One of them being that we don't put stupid dogs in them, young dogs in them, or untrained dogs in them because they can break out of them or other bad things can happen. And, and wire crates just don't serve the purpose of the average pet owner. Start them out in a carrier. You can graduate by size. They hold their value as long as you maintain them. You can always give them to friends or keep them for the next dog that you end up having. Okay, so moving on, we're going to our next item. B, a little bit harder for me to, uh, oh, here we go. And then we have the uh, dog beds, right? And I, I'll be honest with you, I don't give my dogs dog beds. They have to earn them. Um, all of the dog, once they achieve house dog status, have their own and um, I also have a mega chewer and this dog is a, you know, I mean, he's, and he's, we, we keep him fairly occupied so that he doesn't become destructive, but he loves to chew and he loves to chew bedding. So he doesn't get bedding as a result of that. We have to make sure that we put him on something that he's not going to be able to destroy. The, um, these canine ballistics beds are fantastic. Um, I've gotten two of them for my English pointer spider, who is the mega chewer. Uh, he has one for both his travel crate and for his, uh, the crate that he uses when he's at home, which is actually a big 700 because he's a, he's a fairly big boy and, uh, he hasn't been able to do it. He's had it for probably about six or seven months now. I love this thing. Uh, yeah, it's a little spendy, but I have not had any problems with it. He cannot destroy it. He has scratched at it. He has tried to get it. A lot of the bedding uh, that these guys make are made for wire crates, which meets the criteria. And only trained dogs go in wire crates, and only trained dogs get to have bedding that they can't, that they won't destroy because they've learned to be respectful of it. But yeah, if you're going to purchase that, 
I'd rather see you spend one money once than go and buy a whole bunch of dog beds that your dog's going to rip to shreds. I hear a lot, you know, my dog never does those things. I guarantee you, you put them in an environment where those things are going to be possible. And I can assure you that you're going to end up with a hefty vet bill or spending a bunch of money on vets. I had a dog years ago that um, over the course of his uh, life, well, actually, in uh, the course of the first two years I had him, cost me about $900 in dog beds because, and he, he didn't care if you were right there. So different story as far as training goes altogether. But once he learned to be respectful of his beds, I could leave him in a crate, so on and so forth. But it took two years for that to happen. Okay. So doing that and moving on. Now we're going on to our next item. This is an arduous process and I apologize for that, but it's the best I can do with what I got, right? So we did dog beds and berry kennels. Now we're talking about power chewers, right? Every dog, and you'll notice um, if you look at the screen, at the top of your screen, um, at the, oh, um, I'm pretty sure you can see it. Well, I guess not. Um, let me go back there. I don't want to get rid of that. There we go. Okay, so um, the Nylabone Power Chewers, right? Um, these are for dogs who are super destructive. And like I said, I have a power, I actually have two power chewers. My smallest, oldest dog and my youngest, biggest dog are both power chewers. So we're always going to make sure that we err on the side of, of caution when it comes to providing our dog with appropriate chew toys. And the Nylabone Power Chew toys fit a lot of those criteria. Uh, you can get sizes that are appropriate for every dog, every breed, every stage of life. And one of the two things that we are absolutely adamant about when we're both for dogs that we own and for client dogs is we classify chew toy toys as two things. It's either a pacifier toy, which is these chew toys, or it's an interactive toy, which we'll get into in a couple minutes. These are things that we do together. So a pacifier toy is something that the dog can engage with on his own in his crate or quietly on his dog bed while y'all are eating dinner or watching TV. And there's criterion that go along with being a pacifier chew. The chew itself has to be longer or bigger than the dog's head. It has to be of a circumference that the dog cannot close his mouth around it. And it has to be of a density that the dog cannot destroy it within, you know, like the raw hides, which are highly dangerous for dogs. But basically these meet all those criteria. Um, and basically the reason that we want them to be so, you know, thick enough that the dog can't close his mouth around them. Is I'm sure a bunch of you have seen the meme on Facebook or wherever of the retriever with the deer antler down his throat. That's why if he can close his mouth around a thing, he can swallow it. And if he, if it's bigger, if it's not bigger than his head, again, same thing, he can swallow it. So we want to make sure that the dog has something fleshy to chew on. Um, a lot of the toys that are currently being manufactured are not really considered uh, suitable for power chewers. Um, and even some of these toys, you really have to look. Um, I mean, if you have a Molosser or a Malinois or something that's a super chewer, uh, there's certain things that you're going to have to look for uh, and look at when you give your dog toys. But the Nylabones for your average, you know, for your power chewers, uh, most the average pet dog power chewer, um, these are going to be completely adequate. Um, moving on to the next item. Boy, we got a bunch of these to get through. It's kind of scary, I know. Um, okay, this is what we consider to be an interactive toy. This is the uh, ethical why they call it ethical pet. I just like them because of the design. It's got a nice handle. Um, it's got a nice handle. Um, oh, where are we? There we go. At the top, you can see the handle that the, the owner can hold on to. Um, it's big enough around to where the dog is going to have to be able to use his back teeth to get a grip on, and plus the ball as well. So it's going to nest between those uh, premolars and the carnassial or in the uh, the eye teeth at the front. So, and, and again, this is not something that the dog should be allowed to engage with on his own. Um, and the funny thing is, is if you look, this only has seven um, 
people, you know, seven reviews. And most of the reviews are negative because people foolishly allow their dogs to engage with this toy on its own. It's made of rope. Of course the dog's going to destroy it. Why give it to them as a pacifier toy when there are other more suitable things that cost a lot less? A lot of people get into the habit of just, you know, just basically buying a bunch of stuff for their dogs and uh, ending up having to replace it because the dog has destroyed it. And this is one of the reasons why. Appropriate tools for appropriate tasks. This is not a pacifier toy. This is a toy that you interact with with a dog. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the other things that we uh, use as a pacifier toy, or I mean, I'm sorry, as an interactive toy is the Frisco uh, Five Knot Dog Toys. I love these things. I really do. They're long enough. They're a couple of feet long, and you're actually able to, you know, get you know, two-handed tug with a dog um, or be able to get, you know, get your dog to give you some really good grips on this. And again, these are things that we actually the dog access to we play with the dog and then we remove access and put the toy away i know a lot of people um my husband peter gave the term the guilt box where people are going out and buying tons and tons and tons of toys just like kids and christmas tree they unpack all their toys and they end up playing with the boxes you'd be surprised at what little regard dogs have for things when there's too many of them find one thing create meaning for that one thing and use that. It's a big money saver in the end. All right, moving on to our next thing. There's got to be an easier way to do this. Anyone out there that uses Streamer, StreamYard can tell me exactly what that is. Um, okay, so another thing that basically we talk about interactive toys. These are the Ray Allen tug toys. These are for serious dogs. Um, I'm really a big fan of the Kongs on the ropes. I'm really a big fan of the jute bite suit tugs, Syntac tugs, all of these. They all have their purposes. You want to look for one that has two handles. You don't really want to have one with one handle, especially with a novice dog. Uh, ball on a ropes are always great things. You can actually create them. And there's the five knot tug rope um, that I was talking about. If They sell it on Ray Allen, okay? And I mean, Ray Allen is associated with uh, one of the big pet uh um, supply distributors, but this is a tool that they use pretty frequently. So, you know, it, that says a lot about the product. Um, I really, really like playing tugs with dogs or playing tug with dogs. This is something that you can do. It's actually very instructional. It helps teach mouth control and it's a really good toy to engage in with your dog and create a more meaningful relationship. Um, that pretty much covers the toys. So let's move on to some of the other things. Um, basically, part of the things that we have, I know a lot of people are opposed to the dog pens for a variety of reasons. Uh, we travel a great deal, and a lot of times we have young dogs that I'm not going to walk them in an area that I know has been uh, traveled by other dogs. I don't know the other dogs. So I'm going to have an X-Pen set up. This is from, you know, way back in the dog show days where we used to have a bunch of these and we'd string them together so that we could air multiple dogs simultaneously without having to hand walk them. Uh, I now have three and a half acres and I don't have to do any of those things. But for owners, a lot of times owners set these up in their homes with wee wee pads. We don't do that either. This is just a convenient place to put your dog after those things are done. He can hang out there and play. He can sleep on a bed. He can learn how to be appropriately behaved in the confines of a small space that we can control. So um, our use of these things and other people's use of these things are, are slightly different, but basically it's just a, a containment system that's not a crate under supervision that the dog is allowed to engage in activities, playing with his toys, things like that. We're not putting any substrates down for him to urinate or defecate on. We may supply with a nice comfy bed, but still we're not using this as an exchange for crate training. We're using this as a meaningful place to teach our dog how to become an appropriate house pet. So then we get back down to certain things that are important to have, regardless of whether or not you, you know, are going to be grooming your dog or, or not, right? Um, <clears throat> we have 
a bunch of different things that we use for dog grooming. And all of these, almost all of my supplies, I'm not going to go through all of them because there's just so many, come from a place called Cherry Brook at cherrybrook.com. And essentially, the things that we use the most of are all things that we get from there. These are all things that are appropriate for dogs with any type of coat, whether you're bathing them, whether you're grooming them, or whether you're basically just, um, you know, maintaining condition until you can get your dog to the groomer. So the first thing, and I know a lot of people are going to object to this, is a grooming table, right? This is the standard 36 by 24 standard is a standard size for most grooming tables. Um, I have an extra large one that basically because I, I see a lot of extra large dogs, but these are both adjustable up and down uh, and you can purchase an arm separately. But basically, if regardless of whether or not you are training your dog, training other people's dogs, grooming your own dog or or basically own a dog that you're going to be giving to a groomer to groom, you are obligated to teach your dog how to stand on a grooming table, um, whether you're grooming the dog or not. And the reason why is because the vast majority of people, I just had a call today, as a matter of fact, because late Friday, um, a woman called dog had laid a savage bite on a guest for the holidays um, because they just stooped down to pet the dog. The dog couldn't see him. Um, because the hair was in the dog's eyes, come to find out the dog had actually been kicked out of multiple groomers. So there's that. And basically what we do when they're very, very young is we put them on a table, we teach them how to stand still. And that way, when they do go to the groomer, your groomer's going to thank you because you have been appropriate in training your dog so that they can be accommodated by a groomer. Uh, really important stuff. It doesn't, it, you know, a, a lot of people are you know, that's a lot of money, but basically it's like, you know, you're doing yourself a favor if you have to groom your own dog because you're not stooping over something. This is adjustable to height so you can stand upright. And it's also appropriate. Your groomer is not paid to train your dog. Your groomer is paid to groom your dog. It's your job to train your dog. Okay, so then the next item, and this is something that everybody should have, whether you do your own groom. Really, really important for people to have one of these. Let me see if I can find it in this long list of things. Um, cordless clippers. I love these things, right? The Wall Arco cordless clipper. Yeah, it's 150 bucks. But you know what? It's the same one that you trim your kid's hair with, right? And so if you already have one of those, then all you need to do is make sure that you maintain blade safety. Um, this is small and it's portable. And the reason we use it is because... For the most part, I'm not doing a professional groomer's job. I stopped grooming dogs many years ago, and I'm not going back to it. But I keep one of these around because I have dogs who have hobbit feet. And especially since winter is coming, we want to make sure that we keep the hairs in between the toes and underneath the pads of the feet clear so that the dogs don't get snowballs um, or collect irritants, especially if you live in a suburban area or in the city where they put all kinds of things down on the road. Uh, in order to mitigate ice and snow and things like that. Um, excuse me, it can be very caustic to dog feet. And although I always advocate for at least a warm water bath um, on the feet every time your dog comes in, we have a couple of things. The cordless clipper enables you to have your dog out in the snow so they don't get snowbound, so their feet don't get snowbound, which can be very, very painful. And it helps you just keep the feet clean and you can dry them faster if there's no hair to help muck that up. So. Uh, an important consideration, most households, especially with male children, have one of these already. And all you're doing is basically using the blade that comes attached to it. Um, it's not a surgical blade, but it's relatively close. And then you just need to condition your dog to the vibration, which we can talk about in another video. But this is something that we have. This is something that I use in the wintertime. I'm using this two or three times a week. Okay, so then after that, the other thing that we're going to talk about, since we're already at feet, is we're going to be talking about feet, right? One of the things that we basically use all the time um, for people who have dogs that go out in the snow a lot is we we're talking about foot protection. So the very first thing is Musher Secret, Paw Wax. I love this stuff. Um, we use this pretty frequently. Uh, years ago, I used to have a Wheaton Terrier who 
man, I was on this dog's feet constantly. I was shaving them, waxing them, put booties on the whole nine yards uh, because she would just collect so much snow and ice in between the pads of her feet. And uh, this stuff is great. I mean, it's a musher secret. The mushers have been using this for years. Hunting dog people, people who are out in the in the in the real world, actually doing stuff with their dogs in inclement weather, use this stuff constantly. It's. A, um, I've had many many dogs. I think I've had the same container of musher secret now for like at least 15 years, and I'm putting it on dogs constantly. So it, you know, a little bit goes a long way. And again, 20 bucks. And I've had just in the last 20 years, I think I've had. 11 or 12 animals. Um, I haven't had, I, I still have it. I still have the same product. Um, getting a little bare, I should probably get some more, but I have enough to at least get me through with the three dogs that I currently have. It's a good investment. If you're out in the weather a lot, if you like to walk your dog when, uh, you know, well, because you do have to walk your dog when the weather's bad, helps you with cleanup when you bring the dog back in. It's a good product to have around. The other thing that we do a lot of, um, oh, well, actually not so much with the exception of my new dog, uh, my two English Shepherds are not really, uh, they don't necessarily require um, footing, uh, you know, booties, but um, we do a variety of different booties. I'm fond of a bunch of different booties. A couple of these are, and now I got to go slow because I lost my place. There we go. Um, this is the, the Mountain Ridge Iditarod Sled and Pet Dog Booties. These guys know how to do it. If you look at this page, it tells you what they have um, as far as the sizes, um, and then they tell you exactly how to size your feet. This is not going to be equipment you're going to be able to put on your toy poodle. Uh, these are things for dogs that are probably at least 45 pounds or more, and basically uh, we have other we have other. Um, pieces of equipment for dogs that are smaller than this. But again, this is Mountain Ridge, manufacturers of sled dog equipment. Um, it's a great product. I have personally used them. I know clients who do use them. And essentially, they are relatively disposable because they do wear quickly because they're designed for quick on and off and they're designed for um, protection of the dog's feet. But, you know, obviously, if you are, you know, Suburban Sally with your little, um, you know, Wheat interior, you can absolutely get through several seasons of using these things, right? Okay, so um, next is, and I love these. I think they're just adorable. Um, come on, show screen. There we go. They're just so cute. I just got to find them. Wag Wellies by Wagware. They're adorable right? They're cute. They're super cute. They actually come in different colors. Um, you can, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, there we go. That's the color. Uh, you can all kinds of different. They also have a sizing thing. Uh, the sizing guys, you have to click on it and basically it tells you exactly what size. Paw length, paw width. This is your toy breed sizes. Body weighs between five and 12 pounds. Um, so this, these come with, with a lot of size, right? I mean, they come with a lot of size variability. And the reason that these are great is because I'll be honest with you. Um, one thing, the only thing that's really, you know, they're fashion forward, all these beautiful colors. Uh, the one thing that they, they, uh, there's some sizing issues is or not sizing issues, but they, they can be kind of slippy. So you have to make sure that they're secured appropriately. A lot of people that I know that use these will actually use vet wrap. Uh, the front feet have a tendency to flip off easier than the rear feet do. So what they'll do is they'll secure them with vet wrap, which is not a bad idea. If you're going to be out for any length of time, um, they do not, they're not completely waterproof or weatherproof, especially if you're sloshing around whether water uh, moisture can get in from the top. Uh, but again, it's a great product. They're very cute. I know they're a little spendy, but basically these are something that you're going to have for a fairly long time. And I actually had to go hunting for these because I was really, really disappointed that the only place that had them for sale was and then I actually found the manufacturer. Um, here they are. Mutt trackers. These are great. Um, I know these these come in uh, a come in a variety of different sizes as well. They have more latitude. I believe there's ten. 
drawbacks to these, which there's two, is this, the price is um, you only get two boots. So you have to spend two times the money. Um, and they're not, you can't wash them in a washer, like a, a clothes washer. You have to wash them by hand. But I'll be honest with you, you know, um, they're not going to be washed that frequently uh, in the wintertime. You wash them maybe a season and you're good to go. But for the most part, the long lasting, they're durable. Um, I have um, I have a pair of these that I've had for a very long time, at least 11 or 12 years. And I think that they four or five times throughout that entire length. I, you know, I make sure that there's nothing gunky on the inside, but as far as the outside, they're boots. They're designed for wearing and for protecting your dog's feet. Uh, they all also only come in the color black, which most people might be opposed to, but hey, it's a boot. It's for keeping your dog dry, keeping him safe, and keep making it easy for you to clean your dog up when you bring him back inside from inclement weather. Right? Okay. So well, I guess we're moving right along here. It's like keep getting used to this thing. Um, all right. So we've done the booties. We've done the musher secret. We've done the clipper. We've done the grooming table, the dog pens, tug toys, um, dog beds, very kennels. And let's do dog. Um, there we go. Dog, uh, not blankets. They're not blankets component of, of putting dogs in clothing, but I do own a number of, I have owned a number of dogs in the past that required in order to protect them from the inclement weather that we get in the mid-Atlantic. Um, when I lived up in New York, um, my German Shepherds never needed it. Uh, most of my sporting dogs did. Uh, they don't hunt in the wintertime anyways, and when you have them, expect them to be outside for any length of time. Um, I love the weather, weather beater coats. Uh, Dover Saddlery also makes a coat for dogs, which you can get them. I have one that's fleece lined that I've had for 20 years. It was a gift from a friend and uh, it's gone through three dogs. I mean, it's, and it's a great coat. It really is. Uh, these, one of the things I like about these coats is if you look at the bottom line, they wrap around the chest. Um, and this is a criterion for me, especially in the winter time. Because we're outside for any length of time, we're protecting vital organs, right? Um, with male dogs, this uh, the Comfortech Reflexive Parka, uh, this 300D right over here, I love this coat. For male dogs, all I have to do is flip this up over the back so that they can lift their leg and not get it all over the coat. But these are washable. They're really durable coats. Um, and they're great. There's a bunch of other ones that are in here that are appropriate for specific weather some for rain, there's some for, um, you know, other conditions, uh, you know, when you're very, very in really, really, you know, windy conditions and things like that, but you don't necessarily need something that's super insulated, but their insulated coats really can't be beat. There's very, there's only one other product that I prefer over these, um, but they're a little bit, they can be a little spendy. And uh, let me get there. I think everyone knows who I'm going to suggest. Uh, Super, super nice. There we go. The Herda Wind and Cold Coats. Okay. I love these things. I absolutely love these things. Um, they're spendy. I'm not going to lie. But the thing is, though, is your dog's going to be with you. Once he's an adult, um, he's going to be with you for a couple of years. And these things are designed for people who actively engage in activities outdoors. The weather beater coats are great. Uh, these kind of have weather beater beat in a couple of things like the body warmer right here. I had one of these. Uh, they're actually really durable. Um, I actually, this is the first time I, I have to replace it. It's like almost 17 years old. Um, I love these things. And basically it's like, you know, it, a wine uh, is wearing this, a wine runner is wearing this. And my English pointers, you know, especially in the house in the wintertime, it's, it's unfair to expect them being in my 61 degree house without some type of insulating warmth, right? So I'll put them in one of these and they don't object at all. And, you know, my coated dogs, they don't need this, but my not coated dogs absolutely need this. Um, the other coats that I really like are these rain blockers, right? Look how far down the front legs they go. And they cap, you know, they, they cover the thighs in the back as well. And it's, they're nice. Cold 
Black Friday thing. Um, they're great coats. Uh, the Extreme overall, I love this thing. Um, I actually am probably going to get one for one of the dogs that I currently have now because I think that he is going to appreciate it because we still go outside. I mean, he still needs exercise, uh, but I'm not going to have him freeze just because I want to do things outside. Uh, the herd of coats, they, it's like I said, they can be, they can be a little spendy, but I'll be honest with you, they're worth the money. Uh, it's like the, like I said, the Dover coat that I still have and the weather beater coat. I've had them for years and years and years. They're on dogs every year. Um, and basically I haven't had any problems with them with fitment, uh, with their adjustability or any of that. Uh, the herd of coats can't be beat as far as the value for your money goes. Okay. Now, some of the other things that we talk about are grooming implements. I know a lot of people don't really want to groom their dogs. I can appreciate that, but ultimately what needs to happen is you need to condition your dog to be groomed by strangers, or you can save a bunch of money and groom your dog yourself. And we've already talked about the clippers and the, the, uh, the grooming table and things like that. So now basically one of the things that I want, to th want you to uh, think about are basically in grooming lexicon, there's stripping knives um, or shedder blades and things like that. And basically one of the things that we use a lot is uh, speed strippers, right? And these basically help you pull undercoat out from under uh, the top coat, especially this time of year. Uh, a lot of dogs are blowing coat like crazy. Uh, double coated dogs, even dogs like Springers and Goldens who don't really technically have an undercoat, you can pull all that spare dead hair out from underneath that top coat um, in order to, uh, you know, one, help the dog generate new coat and two, stop the shedding, right? These are the whole stop the shedding uh, pieces of equipment just because it's really, really important if you want to maintain coat health on your dog and if you want to make it easier on your groomer. These are tools that you use in order to do that. So one of the other tools that I use a lot, there's a couple of them here. Actually, I have a, dozens of them, but we're only going to show you a handful. Um, the pet shedding tool, there's two of these, and I love them a lot. This is the one that's a little bit more ergonomically designed. Uh, it's easier for people who have uh, hand strength issues with. This is, yeah, let me get rid of that. Braided blade at the end. And you can see by the handle that it's a little bit more ergonomically designed for you to rest your fingertips in this slot that runs along the center. And these are great. They're actually a, originally a horse tool. Again, they come in, you know, fashion forward colors. If you're into that thing, they're 25 bucks and you're going to have it forever. Um, I have one that basically here let me uh let me get to the other one let's say oh, present present i'm doing that okay so something's happened here remove present don't want slides yeah, I don't know what's happening, but of course it's not working for me now. Of course it's not. Okay, there we go. Um, all right, so the other one is the original design, and uh, I've had this thing forever. Um, I like it. There's two. There's two tools. Oops. Oh, I lost it. There we go. Deshedding dog brush. This is the original version right? If you notice, it's rounded, so you actually really have to grip. There's no place to rest your fingers, uh, but it's the exact same tool. It's the exact same quality. It's the same serrated blade, uh, serrated blade at the bottom. It's a little bit shorter, I believe. I think this is only five inches. Um, it's a little bit cheaper, obviously, because you're not looking for, you know, you're not looking, you're not fashion forward. This is just a tool. So, of course, it's not going to be as expensive. It works just as well. Uh, but if you have grip issues, this is something that you may want to consider, especially if you have a dog like a shepherd or any double coated breed where you're going to be working on that uh, undercoat for a while. Right. Um, so then. Uh, thing that I have, which is a really, really great tool. Um, of 
course I have to find it. I love this thing. I give these to people. This is a stainless steel hair shaper. And basically it looks just like your dad's old straight razor, uh, except it's got a finger guard um, and it, it has a, it has a blade guard. So you will never ever cut a dog. But if you have a dog that has any kind of downy hair, like behind the ears, I know shepherds get it a lot. I know most of your double coated long haired breeds, like um, coated shepherds, collies, um, sorry. And even, you know, any of your center breeds or spaniel breeds, any dog that has any kind of like floofy coat or feathering that develops hair behind their ears um, or mats in between their legs or underneath the armpits. This is the tool that you use, especially if you have a dog who's sensitive to the vibration of a clipper. This is a low tool. The whole kit's $5.99. Um, the blade, basically you can purchase them here on Cherry Brook. They cost next to nothing. Um, I've had two of these. I lost one. Bought another one, found the old one. The old one I've had was when they were still wet hair shapers. I've had that thing since 1972. The blades are still able to get. You can get them anywhere. You can actually, you know, anyone that supplies uh, straight razor blades, same, the same tool, exact same tool. Um, every toolbox should have one, whether you're a pet owner or whether you're a professional groomer or a professional trainer. Everyone should have one of these tools. They're the best thing since great whales. Or the greatest thing says great whales. Um, super nice, super nice tools to have around. The other thing that we use, man, I really wish there was an easier way to do this. Apologies for the big delay. Uh, groom a little groom with me. These. I've had one of these forever. Um, I was gifted one by a friend of mine 100,000 years ago. I still have it. Um, I have put these in people's socks, you know, Christmas stockings. I've gifted them to friends that have dogs. They're a great tool. It's a great little thumb notch for you. Um, it's slightly larger than the e-collar Technologies 300 mini transmitter. And these things are, if you notice, these little things, they're super soft, rubbery. Um, and they're great as a massage for your dog when he's in the tub. They're great as a stripping tool to help lift all that dead hair when your dogs start blowing out. And I can't, I'll be honest with you, I've never met a dog who didn't like these things. Um, I've never met a dog who didn't enjoy the interaction. Is it great for uh, coat maintenance? It's great for blood circulation to the skin to promote good, healthy coat growth. There's no part of your dog's anatomy that this can't go on. You can use it on the inside of the legs. You can use it on the forelegs and the inside of the forelegs where most dogs are very, very sensitive to being brushed. You can actually use it on the top of the head and the sides like the cheeks and under the, under the chin. I've never known a dog to regret any of their experiences with this. And, uh, and I, you know, they're easy to clean. You just stick it in a tub of water. They're made of rubber. You put it in a little bit of water with some soap in and then you take uh, you know, you can get a second one and just scrub them with each other, kind of like you do when you're taking a stain out of a shirt, just rub it against itself um, and to help clean them up. And they're, or you can stick them in a microwave or not a microwave, I'm sorry, a dishwasher. Uh, they are dishwasher safe. Ask me how I know. Um, but super great tools. I love these things. Uh, I don't know of a coat type where they're not beneficial. Uh, the only thing that I wouldn't do them on is probably something like a poodle and full show coat. Uh, obviously an Afghan, something like that. But for your average pet dog and for most average working dogs, I'll be honest with you, there's for the simple, the simplicity of being the one tool that does a lot, this would be okay. All right. So let me see if there's anything else um, before we close out. But for the most part, I think that's pretty much it. There's a couple of other things that I would like to add but in the brevity of time, I think what we're going to do is, is just kind of nix that. And if you are interested, you can send me an email at info at lionheartcanine.com or you can uh, message me here on Lionheart Canine's Facebook page. All the linky goodness to all of the things that we consider to be um, approved use for dogs that you're going to be using more than once on a daily basis things that your dogs will enjoy, things that you will enjoy, and things that basically are going to enable you 
to uh, live your life a better way with your dog. Um, the toys, we have a little bit more, a couple more toys involved. We have a lot more grooming tools. Um, my prior history was grooming show dogs. So I have a lot of stuff to contribute as far as that goes. And basically all of these things, again, are curated items that we've been using for every single one of them is useful. Every single one of them is something that we use virtually every day. So thank you very much. Happy Black Friday. Hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving and take care. We'll see you next time. Bye.